Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar where I am joined by Celine Boucher. Uh, all the way over in the US, I'm, I'm based in London, so this is a transatlantic webinar today. Um, and uh, you are joining us to talk and listen to a conversation about grassroots entrepreneurship and how that can help to future proof companies, drawing on lessons of Celine's uh, from Zurich's next program, which we will hear all about uh, in just a second. Now, before we get started, just to do the perfunctory uh, hellos and the introductions and, and all of that, um, we're going to have a 30-minute uh, discussion, first and foremost, followed probably by about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A time before wrapping up. So this will roughly in total be a sort of 45-minute session. Now, who am I? My name is Jamie Q. Um, I am the managing uh, partner and founder of Studio Zao. Um, and Studio Zao is a London headquartered, as I mentioned earlier, innovation and talent development studio. What we do is we help global organizations to empower and develop entrepreneurs who we believe are the, uh, the, the leaders of the future. And we work with a, a wide array of different organizations from public sector to private sector. Um, and entrepreneurship is really the, the topic that got myself um, and Celine connected in the first place. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly hand it over to Celine to introduce who she is, um, her background uh, within Zurich and, and the work she's been doing at Next. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into all what, about what Next is and the conversation. Yeah, thank you very much, Jamie. So hi, everyone. My name is Celine, uh, as Jamie hinted to. I'm based in the US. I live in the suburbs of Chicago and I work for Zurich Insurance uh, within Zurich. My day job, uh, I'm an HR program manager, so I oversee um, mid to large scale HR transformations. And then I also um, oversee uh, with other colleagues uh, a movement called Next, which is entrepreneurial, and I'll be happy to share more about today. Yeah, so happy to jump straight in. Um, so this is our logo for us. So you'll, you'll be seeing uh, a bit of that in the coming slides. And um, let me start maybe first with some background around Zurich Insurance Company itself. So in case you're not familiar with Zurich, um, Zurich is headquartered in Switzerland, um, over 140 years old. We have about 55,000 employees worldwide. What you can see here on the left is our headquarter in the suburbs of Chicago, where I would usually work if I wasn't working from home. Uh, we are a multi-line insurance group. That means we don't just provide retail and life insurance. We also have commercial insurance and we insure more than 90% of the Fortune 500 through that. We provide products and services in over 215 countries. Uh, just as a comparison, the UN recognized that the world has 250 countries. So we're pretty, we're pretty close to, to being in all of them. And in 2019, we achieved a business operating profit of 5.3. Billion. So that's just a little bit of like where this next movement navigates in. So kind of what's our uh, playing field here? So what's what's next? Um, I wanted to start first with our why. So why did we get all of this started? Um, as you might have heard, the the workforce is changing when it comes to generations. At the moment, on average, the the millennials make it up about 40% of the workforce, and in the coming four years, we expect that to shift to 75%. So that's across all industries. Um, so this, this age group is really growing um, and we also have Gen Z entering the workplace. So the oldest Gen Z are 24 years old. So they're, they're starting to be um, in the workforce. And these employees have very different expectations, actually not just as employees towards a company, but also as a customer and just seeing companies also as a, as a like, member of society overall. As we talked with employees within Zurich, we heard that people want to have more of a voice. You heard Zurich has 55,000 employees. It, it's easy maybe to feel unheard uh, in that space. So there was a need to, to give people that voice also to promote intergenerational dialogue. Uh, and then overall, I think just with all sustainability topics we're talking about nowadays, future proofing is, is as important as ever. Um, what you see on the bottom is how we translated that in the vision. So next is shaping Zurich's legacy. We give a voice to our generation to future-proof Zurich globally. 
by listening and challenging the current state, and then hashtag no filter, which is just encouraging people to be open, to be honest, um, and, and to strive for um, the better future together. Now, who's doing all of that? On the right, you can see um, top right, the global team. So we were initially 12 people who founded Next in the middle of 2019. Um, we all volunteered our time, at least 10%, to kind of dedicate to this cause that we created ourselves. So we like made this all, kind of, we, yeah, we designed everything ourselves. And as you can see a little bit on that map, we're a very global team. We represent all uh, continents and regions. Um, what you can't quite make out here is that we're all from business, different business areas. So I'm in HR, I have colleagues in strategy, communications, underwriting. So it's a really, really mixed throughout the business. Uh, we did not know each other before we got started and collaborate globally, uh, mostly virtually to, to drive a lot of change. And then what you see below are our local hubs. So um, earlier this year, we realized that we want our activities and initiatives, which I'll touch on, to have more traction. And we need kind of people to focus really in countries on what change they can drive there. So we created seven hubs um, and from Mexico to Japan. And uh, they've been since July driving a lot of our strategy on a global level, engaging employees and, uh, and driving change through that, which has been amazing to see. So what are we actually doing? Um, I thought it might be most helpful to share um, our strategy with you and then some initiatives, which I'm happy to dive deeper in uh, after, after I, kind of, I finish this little walkthrough. So we have three areas that we're focusing on. I mentioned earlier that people want to have a voice. So that's one of our strategic pillars to advocate for um, employees to have a voice in key business decisions so that they can help the future that they will live in and also to create intergenerational dialogue. How do we do that? Our very first initiative was called Ask Next, um, and it's very still very successful. We give business areas the chance to reach out to us when they have a new project or initiative and they want the perspective of, kind of our wider community. And then our community can volunteer to help shape initiatives and projects and really at the inception. And that can range from sustainability vision, to new benefits programs, to underwriting, uh, redoing some of the organization structures, so really broad topics that we are able to have people weigh in on and, and use their voice. Another program is called Next Change, so that's an, a global uh, intergenerational cross-mentoring scheme, so where we match up people across generations to mentor each other. It's not about technical skills, it's about building empathy and better understanding where everyone's coming from. And then the last one is Next Views, where we advocate for the next gen to have a seat in decision bodies, like steering committees, leadership team meetings, and really harnessing the power that we can gather from um, having a wider age span on those decision bodies. And again, happy to touch more on these later, so feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Um, our second area is connection. The internal part of that connection, we um, act on through our hubs that I mentioned earlier, and the external part, we did in October our first virtual summit that was open to everyone, so not to, not just Zurich, but everyone outside Zurich as well, on topics such as um, future of work, future of society, future of generations. We had different panel sessions for that. And then another piece here that we're very passionate about is best practice sharing, where we connect with other corporations who maybe run similar efforts or have an interest in learning more and where we can help each other. So if I want anyone listening and curious, please reach out to me. The contact details will be there at the end because we'd love to connect with more companies. Our last pillar is social innovation. Um, so here we have um, a, a bit of a different twist coming in. We want to support socially responsible leaders, as it says here, so it's social entrepreneurs. So uh, people who, who have their own enterprise in the social space, doing social good, that are aligned with the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. And here we partner with One Young World, which is an amazing organization who helps um, young people uh, yeah, be successful with their efforts to achieve the SDGs by 2030. And we also partner with the Zurich Foundation, which is a bit of a separate entity to Zurich itself and is all about giving back to the communities and, uh, and making an impact. So that's kind of 
tried like compressed version of how we're doing things, but again, happy to touch in more detail on, on anything that anyone's interested in. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of societal and, and social good that's being done as part of the next uh, program. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of step back a little bit for, for our discussion, because some of the themes that I was really interested to, to talk about with you um, is, yes, intergenerational entrepreneurship and, and the importance of that dialogue within organizations or why organizations need to embrace it. Um, but to kick things off, I mean, there's a... Um, there's, there's like a common thread around this and more commercially driven entrepreneurship that maybe some of the viewers out there have in mind when they think of internal innovation. They think of you know, new products, new services, launching new businesses into the market. Um, but something that, that I really resonated uh, with you on was around the need for, for an internal movement, right? But there needs to be change. There needs to be a movement to drive change within an organization. And what I found amazing was that the next program has created massive change in the movement of this within within Zurich. Um, and it's quite grassroots. It's not top-down mandated from the CEO. It's very much kind of bubbled up from individuals from across the business. So my first question is kind of can you can you explain a little bit more about what grassroots and uh, in this case, yes, intergenerational, you mentioned this concept. What is grassroots intergenerational entrepreneurship in, in your eyes? And why is it so important that organizations need to embrace more of this going forward? Sure. Yeah. So um, let me start with the grassroots part. Um, so the first founding team, uh, we had people with a passion and we also had people who had already some experience leading um, internal efforts around like emerging leaders, young leadership. So we're part of ERGs or, or similar efforts just to give us kind of a bit of the right skill set to get started with. Um, and uh, as we assembled that team, we decided that we would rotate the team out every year and have people apply to join. And really there is um, the requirements to apply is, is basically just that you want to apply. Like we don't want your manager to nominate you or your HR business partner, or you, we don't want you to just apply because you're in some succession plan. We need the passion and we need the energy. And I think that has really helped us maintain or, or build out even more that grassroots part of it. Like you don't need to be a manager. Um, the only requirement as to how long you've been with a company is six months, just because we figure like you need to be like at least like comfortable in your job because before you take on extra. Um, and and we look we're looking for people who really have that mindset of I think through grassroots really like grow something, right? Like roll up your sleeves because everything we're doing, we're designing ourselves. Yeah, like when, for example, the cross mentoring program that we're doing, we have two people from HR on the team right now, but that doesn't mean that we've extensive experience in mentoring programs, right? So we're designing this as we go and we need people who are comfortable doing that. And I think the other part of grassroots, which has been very important to us, and, and you've touched on that, is that we don't have an executive sponsor per se in the organization. We have very senior leaders who highly support us and also like visibly will like mention next or or ask us to come to their town halls but none of that was like by design it's just because it feels like the right thing to do for them and they see the opportunity that they can have by collaborating with us uh, but we're not yeah we're not a, like an hr initiative or something from the ceo office uh, so that's also i think where we maintain our grassroots essence is that we can make our own decisions um I think what might not be as visible for externals when you were seeing earlier the slides around next is that we introduced green and in the Zurich original color palette green wasn't really there like we were supposed to stay in the blue and white space so we wanted to differentiate ourselves and also visibly show like this is different this is independent um like obviously we'll, we'll play in the in the norms of the corporation but at the same time we also want to do something different here and then on your, um, what was your second part? It was a grassroots, oh, the entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, here having people who volunteer their time, who have a passion to drive change uh, and, and go really from ideation to execution. And a lot of what we're doing, I mean, we're labeling it pilots or prototypes because as I mentioned, we're doing this for the first time. Um, so we're iterating, we're learning, and people have really enjoyed 
kind of stepping out of their day jobs to be able to create something from scratch or bring in new ideas and and have kind of the, the permission like just from within the next group to to go with it like try it out uh some of the initiatives i mentioned uh, are kind of are going to move into business as usual soon or we'll just run them but there's not that much new design and the new people onboarding will have the opportunity to make new suggestions and to the team and then decide collaboratively on on what we're going to design and do next and i think that, that's been really important as well for those people and then i think your last point was around why is it like why should a corporation care i guess like why is it important yeah. um so i mean we see obviously there's the element of our topics themselves that we're driving so we're actually giving people a voice so that might then conclude in an increase like ENPS, employee NPS score, people feel engaged. Um, we tend to attract like hypos who then also kind of find a new purpose and something to like pour their energy into, especially finding their nationalization, like full-time role, next career step. This gives them kind of an in-between. Uh, we also upskills for this. I mean, we have um, a lot of speaking engagements that people otherwise might not have. We present to our expo and CEO and chairman of the board. So that's exposure that people might not usually have in their, in their regular jobs. So through that, we're able to, to upskill also the global collaboration piece. Just because Zurich is global doesn't mean every job is. And yeah. gives people an opportunity to kind of come out of their local uh, focus role to collaborate on a local level network. Um, so yeah, and I, and I could go on like there, yeah, lots of benefits. I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, the intergenerational point that, that you, you know, emphasized as well in, in your introduction of, uh, about Next. Um, and I kind of remember that in the virtual summit uh, that, that you also mentioned that Next had a few weeks ago, there was a stat around how um, teams with more of a spread between uh, the eldest member and the youngest member of the team, if there was greater than a 10 year difference in age, actually that team performs up to 30 or 40% better. Um, and there's a positive correlation between that, between an age gap and, and the performance of the team. So it, is, there, is there something that you guys have hit upon in terms of uh, giving more direct access for the youngest generation and in many cases, the entry or, or, or junior level employees direct access to the most senior folk and and how does that dialogue really work as, as part of next and the, the, yeah. the projects that you guys do yeah absolutely um so yeah what you what you reference is a study that was published in forbes where you're right um you have up to a 40 percent higher kind of performance in teams that have a wider age span of like 25 years um and uh so a few a few things how we've kind of been, tried to act on this to ensure that we kind of kind of harness that power in teams uh, first, as um, I mentioned earlier, the program Next Views, which is about inviting um, kind of all generations to the table when it comes to decision making. So we have a few things that are going right now. We have our um, group pension committee within the organization, so they oversee all, all topics around pensions for the group. Um, they uh, take, took a closer look at their, at their committee and realized that they did not have all generations represented, and they're now actually adding a seat for a next gen member, not necessarily someone tied to next, but someone who can represent the generations and their role in that committee will be to be that voice. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's one element we have, our hubs are doing amazing work in their countries. We have, um, um, like on the top of my head, I know that Germany and Spain have now next members joining their leadership team meetings and expo meetings to also there be able to just lend like, their perspective on, on things that are being discussed and decisions that are being made. So kind of slowly embedding kind of all generations in those decision bodies. And mm -hmm. then on a more kind of team level, we are talking with kind of business areas bit by bit as, as they reach out. So we had one um, function reach out to us who realized that their employee population tends to be on the older side because the requirements to be in that business area require like, five to 10 years of studying, um, 10 to 15 years of experience. So how are you supposed to get a Gen Z, like a 24 year old in, if you have like 30 years of experience you need to bring to the job? And so those are topics that we're going to start looking into with them to see 
if there is a possibility to have like a more junior pipeline and to build your talent maybe in-house so maybe you don't require 15 years of work experience but a couple of years will do too and you build that talent and that way you can again increase the, the age span so those are a few of the things that, that i can think of right i see okay that's um i think that's very inspiring because oftentimes um that diversity uh, aspect is not just about diversity of gender or, or of ethnic background but actually age um, plays a big part, especially when when you know when you have uh, more ambiguous and innovative projects that need to be um, ideated and developed and tested and uh, worked on. Especially in situations where I guess when when people when you have to um, borrow time from people, people are volunteering their time. Right? It's not their day job. Um, you know that that kind of diversity of experience and, and viewpoints is so important. Um, I I wonder what success stories. You, you may have about some of the projects that have come out of the next program or some of the initiatives that have come out of the next program. What, what impact has uh, this intergenerational and grassroots approach uh, to this change movement, what impact has that had on Zurich or, or some of the businesses that you guys run or society at large? Yeah, actually on the latter one, so society wise, I think we're, um, we're very happy on how our social innovation area has worked out. So through One Year World and the Zurich Foundation, we're able to sponsor scholars. So that's social entrepreneurs all around the world from um, Brazil to Nepal, uh, who have social enterprises from I don't know, mental health through teaching kids soccer to um, helping women manage finances. And we've been, so we take on scholars for a year. We help them by providing some trainings um, that we might, might be applicable to the corporate space as well as for them. So like how to pitch, how to negotiate. Those are all things that we can help them with. We give them access to LinkedIn Learning. Uh, and in addition, also the Zurich Foundation is, uh, is, is, is issuing grants to them so that they can also financially kind of continue to pursue their enterprises and, and build them out and impact more people. And so that's been fantastic to see how a corporation like Zurich, that's very large, as I mentioned earlier, can have yeah. such a significant impact on people. And one of our scholars from um, this last cycle, he's in Malawi, and I think he got um, a, a grant for $10,000 or something, which in the large scale of things for a corporation isn't that, like, isn't that substantial, right? It, it, it won't hurt us that much. But he was saying how it will impact hundreds and thousands of people locally because he'll be able to take his enterprise to the next level. Um, so those are our stories that we obviously like love. I mean, everything around the sustainable space has been great. Connecting with these people and learning from them, uh, because I think when you work, I've been with Zurich for almost 15 years, and you you don't have naturally touch points with with social entrepreneurs like that. So yeah, uh, that's, yeah definitely an impact that we felt and that we've heard, and that's been amazing. Internally, what we're hearing um, through our kind of extended community that we're building uh, is, is from young people. I think we especially heard it when we opened it up for applications, actually, that people were very grateful to have now this, this channel and this conduit where they can kind of jump on, um, have like an easy way to weigh in on initiatives and projects, get exposure uh, to, to other business areas, collaborate and and that our messaging really resonated with them. In March, we published a manifesto that was pretty, like, yeah, straightforward. Like, <laughs> um, it, like could have ruffled some feathers, but uh, it really spoke to people because they felt like someone was putting like also some harder topics on the table. And you mentioned the piece with age diversity, and I think we've been so focused on on gender, racial, and, and all of these equally important aspects of diversity that the age part hasn't been looked into as much. And at least from someone living in the U.S., we tend to focus more on making sure that the 40 plus like, is is as embedded and has as many opportunities, and maybe miss an opportunity to also kind of to look at the whole. And the whole breadth of ages and, and how we can draw value from that. It, I, I want to come back to something you mentioned um, one of, at the earlier point in, in this conversation when you mentioned actually there's no executive sponsor, right, for next. And that's an interesting one, especially when it's a grassroots movement that like, like this, when you, you make so much impact. Why, 
is there no executive sponsor and why how how has that worked out for you right has that posed challenges has that been actually quite convenient um and the flip side of this is does that mean that there isn't really a very uh clear or a strict kind of uh measurement success measurement process so there are no specific kpis or or, or you know metrics that you're you're working towards is that the case or there are metrics that you've said that you're tracking yeah okay so um, let me start first with the um how is it working out for us to not have a sponsor or why don't we have a sponsor uh so we uh we had in the very early stages before Next even had its name and its vision, we had a conversation with our group CEO. Uh, and he um, he was like, as I said, he's supportive of what we're doing, but at the same time, he was also very clear that he would not necessarily tie this to a business area because then you might need to follow a certain business area's agenda, right? Like someone mm-hmm. might have objectives and goals and that might then kind of impact what you're doing. So it was really encouraging to keep this as independent as we can. And um, yeah, over the course, obviously, like we look for supporters because it's always good to have some people to pilot things with, to have that visibility and to address these topics at the most senior level. But really the point is here is that we don't want to be like put into like a silo or like a box, which can easily happen in a large corporation. Uh, and we want to maintain kind of the liberty and freedom to decide what's important to this group of people and people will evolve, right? I mean, next year I'm rolling off and, and others will take over. But the only way to maintain that kind of grassroots part and, and freedom to decide what's in our vision, what's in our strategy and how do we act on it is to not tie ourselves to an individual or business area or like the country. Um, it has worked. It has worked very well for us overall. I mean, it's interesting. And I think that's where the mindset piece comes in, because a lot of this is about mindset, about people accepting that, oh, there's like this internal startup now, and to some it looks like, oh, they can do whatever they want, it seems. Um, and to some regards, kind of that's true, but obviously we're making informed and intelligence decisions, like we're not just going to do something random that might jeopardize anything. Um, but as we talk with people more and, and kind of explain the rationale of why we've set up our next up the way it is, uh, they they also start to see kind of the opportunity that comes out of that. And um, I think it empowers people also to kind of break through a bit of that red tape. It's something that we want to do anyway at Zorik and that's supportive uh, and kind of to be a bit more daring and, and put themselves out there to drive change. I think the other part you touched on was, okay, does that mean then we are not accountable to anyone? We don't need metrics, we don't have success measures. Um, so yeah, I mean, we we don't necessarily have anyone who contacts us at year end and is like, so where's your dashboard? Like, where can I see the business impact that this had? At the same time, our budget is also like tiny. Like it's, it's tiny. I mean, like, yeah. I think it's less than what what I mentioned the scholar getting. (laughs) So we navigate with very limited funds. Um, So the business case, I guess, if we were to make one would would still work out really well, but more in qualitative terms and quantitative. Now Zurich has, uh, Next has been around for one and a half years now. And as I mentioned, we're all volunteers. We're doing this part like 10% as as a liaison. I'm, I'm dedicating a bit more time to that, but metrics weren't our first focus but will be our focus mm-hmm. for 2021 we do have some metrics like um we have this internal social media network called workplace so how many like, members do we have that there how interactive like how, um, how much interaction do we have how many speaking engagements do we get how many projects and initiatives do we send on to volunteers how many people volunteers so we're able to do a lot through that. The virtual summit, we were tracking signups and um, attendees and all our external speakers kind of all also kind of points for us where everyone did a pro bono. So that's also kind of good cases to then have afterwards because a lot of our speakers, yeah, well, the CEOs or founders of organizations and, and might sometimes like, yeah, take remuneration, but luckily we're able to convince them to do this pro bono. So. We don't yet have a beautiful dashboard. We do have an impact deck that we've pulled together. Okay. We have some metrics and uh, and data in there. But to be honest, um, 
there's no one really like from senior leadership or the group CEO who's asking for that deck. It's more for us in December, we're doing a year end kind of success thank you reel on social media and we needed a list of, of what we're going to do, put in there. So at the moment, I see. also independent in that regard. So that's brilliant. And, and I think that's quite a unique setup, right? I haven't actually heard of that many uh, grassroots movements um, that are is like next where it survives without a clear kind of executive sponsor or, or leader um you you said that comes with the drawback which is obviously the the budget that you're working with is not that big so i actually wonder um as perhaps one of the closing uh, nuggets of wisdom that, that you may be able to share with people out there who perhaps are also looking to build or to see how they can stoke and, and cultivate some sort of more grassroots movement in their organization um how what sort of advice or tips do you have or top sort of two or three things you may say to them especially when there isn't a lot of budget or there aren't a huge amount of resources that, that you know that's available to do it sure um yeah i mean i, I think really past Sure, you, you're very passionate about whatever your focus for your movement is going to be. I mean, it doesn't have to be intergenerational dialogue and future proofing, right? It could be anything. Make sure that you have the passion to drive that. And by that, I mean, things will get hard and this is not your day job, right? So you might not get a lot of like formal recognition for it through the regular kind of performance management tools of your organization because you, you your work doesn't really fit into things. I mean, I've seen that with my mm -hmm. like, kind of mid-year reviews and so on that it's not as easy for managers to assess what you're doing because you don't fit through the mold. Like you're creating something new, you have this little startup. Um, so that's just something to consider as you as you start off. Uh, once you have, I think, a bit of an idea, I would definitely recommend kind of getting some some peers and like allies on board, but like on, on the level, right? So that you can like people who are also like happy to roll up their sleeves, create a vision, um, think about how you want to act on on that, uh, evolve it. I do believe, and what I've seen with the team is it's extremely important to have your manager support for this. So to have to to show them how this will benefit your own development and um, how it will benefit the wider organization or your team, um, what opportunities or um, benefits this can bring to to your day job team and and to your manager. So really be open about that conversation and make sure you have their support because we had employees on the team who were very passionate but whose managers didn't back that as much and that just yeah. puts a lot more strain on them in the kind of work life balance space because they want to do both but it's it's harder to um to reprioritize um for let me think about this and anything else um i mean i i do think that even though you, you might do this without an executive sponsor to kind of maintain your autonomy, uh, get get supporters anyway, right? So have yeah. that dialogue, tell them more about your idea, what you want to do, how it could benefit the company. If you're similar to us, working more in a space of mindset, empathy, uh, kind of having an impact without spending a lot of money on it, make sure that you through that still convey kind of the added value for the organization and if you're not planning on having metrics initially like we are be very open like tell them listen we're gonna like let's try let, let us try this out for a year i might not have a beautiful dashboard for you at the end of the year but i might have some quotes and some success stories and a lot of how we measure our success is also how organically parts of the organization reach out to us so when i have like a business area reach out to me on a random wednesday to ask about something. That for me means, okay, comms did a great job. Like people have heard about us. People see an opportunity to collaborate with us and see some benefit in that. So that in itself is an also mm. a measure of success. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Celine, for sharing some of the, the insights, learnings, um, and the, the way that it's set up the way that this next journey has evolved and unfolded for, for Zurich. Um, I know that we've actually got a few few questions over here from uh, from the audience, uh, and uh, so we can spend a bit of time to answer as many as we can over the sort of next five to ten minutes. Um, there's one here, 
And uh, it's quite a longish question, but I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll try and read it out. So I'm based in Northeast England. I run entrepreneurship workshops and alongside that work at a public sector organization, which is now seeking corporates to join a fully funded program to support entrepreneurs. I started late uh, to a tech issue. Sounds like Zurich is creating this mass movement from the grassroots, yeah. What are your, what are the phases you have in mind to take forward your program and to provide a standard syllabus? Sure, okay. So thanks for the question. Uh, and I'd love to hear more about what you're working on. So please uh, reach out over LinkedIn or email, the contact details will come up. Um, so yeah, our phases, and again, we're, we're still kind of early days, right? Next is about one and a half years old. So the first six months or six to 12 months, for, no, six months, we're all about creating awareness. So just starting like, to just spread the word that this exists now within the organization, um, what, how people can get engaged and kind of start building up some kind of bands, okay? Uh, and then the kind of six to 12 months for us was solidify our strategy and conceptualize all of those initiatives I mentioned earlier. So the ones that weren't kind of this to implement, really work on that internally while kind of outside, continuing to engage with the community and continue to grow it and move people more and more kind of from people who are just like watching and lurking to wanting to take action. Um, and then um, kind of the one year onwards for us has been to pilot and test these, these initiatives, decide which ones are going to continue running with, continue to engage at all levels of the organization. For us in the first year, we didn't focus as much on our APAC region. So for 2021, we really want to engage more APAC and the employees that are there because at the moment the focus has been more on EMEA and North America and South America. Um, and yeah, from there, I mean, I mentioned every year the team will partially rotate. So the team will be able to kind of also strain, maybe change the strategy at some point as needed, evolve things. So I can't really tell you where next will be in five years, um, but I can tell you that for 2021, we have, we have a pretty good plan. Awesome. Um, another question we've got here is, uh, thanks, Lean. What kind of criteria do you use to get people on board of the program? Sure, yeah, great question. So I did briefly mention that at least six months was Eric, so that's just so that they're like established in their day job before we like pull them out for something extra. Um, generationally, there's no requirements. Anyone can apply. Currently, our team is Gen Z to Gen X. That's just based on kind of the applications um, that, that were the best fit. Uh, we, as I touched on the strategy earlier, we had those three areas and behind those areas are teams. So people are assigned to social innovation or connection um, or um, next, next voice. So we have at the moment two people leading next voice. In connection, we have three people who are overseeing the hubs. So they're regional community builders. And we have one person overseeing more like the external connection with the summit and practice sharing. And then social innovation, we have one individual as well. So for those roles, we do look into some more like some skills that are relevant. So social innovation, we were looking for people who have a passion for sustainable development and maybe have done something like that before. But if not, that's fine. We'll, that's, that's part of being the next that you can learn a lot of your skills. Um, for external connection, we were looking for people who have an interest in event management and who are comfortable reaching out to another corporation and asking them to collaborate. Um, so we do have some requirements around that. Uh, beyond uh, these, by the way, we also have two people working on communications and a colleague and myself as liaisons, we're overseeing kind of all the moving bits and parts and pieces. Um, just some high level other requirements is we have a performance management system at Zurich overall. So we, we want people who have, who are meeting their performance objectives or more because someone who's underperforming in their day job, it's not that they, they, they might be fantastic at next, but if they're, if they're already challenged kind of with their manager on their day job, then we don't want to add that extra burden to them to like then have to prove why they would do this. So that's another aspect. And then we are trying to build always a diverse team. So in the last final selection of people, we do check that we have at least one from each region, better even two. We are looking, how it's not like ends up being completely female or completely male. Um, so those are some other aspects that, that come in. 
Excellent. Great question. Um, and I think we may just have time for one final question here, which is um, really interesting work. What would you say are the key challenges that you encountered when building the program? So if, if I can layer on maybe a bit of a time frame, you said earlier, Celine, that it's about a year and a half old now, next. So maybe in the, in sort of the first six months or the first six or 12 months, what were some of the key challenges in starting this whole thing off? Sure. Um, so when it comes to acceptance within the organization, we were all extremely positive and surprised. So I wouldn't list any there. Um, so we designed this in July 19 and in uh, early December 19. So what was that? Four or five months later, we were invited to co-host the annual Zurich leadership team meeting. So that brings together the top 140 leaders. So it's basically a room of CEOs and some CFOs and uh, and we weren't just there for like an hour, we actually co-hosted the event. So I really want to say from a leadership and also employee perspective, internally, acceptance of next new challenges. Uh, I think what we've seen more challenges is we have a very passionate team and they want to do many, many things, but we only have very little time. So our, mm -hmm. um, our biggest challenge has been to make sure we prioritize when needed that people don't burn out um, because they still want to do it all. And that means they may be working after hours or, or working unreasonable times. So that's something that we continue to work on with the team to make sure that we keep it realistic. Because if you add up all of our FTE, the core team, I think it comes up to 1.3 FTE for all those initiatives I mentioned to you um, combined. And uh, I think if you, well, if you add on the hubs, it's an extra 1.4 FTE. So it's I guess in total 2.7 FTE for all of this, but I didn't even touch on everything the hubs are doing. The hubs are doing podcasts, they're doing news, they're doing friends networks. So, so much extra work and yeah, trying to fit that in. Um, and then a very minor one is that we're a very global team and it's just a challenge to get all the time zones like on <laughs> and to talk virtually. And initially in the founding team, we have a colleague from Indonesia um, so me in the U.S., uh, another colleague in the U.S., a colleague in Mexico, and we had a 12-hour time. So it worked out. We managed to get the whole team, including me, on a call. This year, we added a colleague from Australia, which then added another, like, whole other thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a bit silly, but it's really tricky because we want to get all the people on calls, like, at least a few times a month to get also that team feeling. And um, we've never met in person with this new newer team since July. So that's been a bit tricky as well. But we're learning and we're making the best of the wonderful tools that Tech is providing us. Brilliant. Well, um, that's, I think, all we've got time for in terms of questions today. Uh, there were a few more questions we didn't get around to, but um, we're going to share some contact details at the end of this uh, shortly. So you can always um, ping Celine uh, to, to you know, follow up on any questions if you'd like. Um, just to round things up, I just want to quickly say thank you to Celine for joining us to share um, about Next program and what's been happening, what's going to happen and you know how it's been successful and, and the, the rationale behind the way it's been set up and, and the way it's gained momentum. So thank you very much. Um, to say what's happening next, uh, just a very quick one to say that obviously one of the running themes of today's conversation is entrepreneurship. And the reason why I mentioned entrepreneurship is a key thread amongst all of this is that for, for Studio Zao, um, the, the business that uh, I lead, what we do is we do help organizations to focus on how to identify and empower and unleash that internal entrepreneurial capability um, to make that moot and to make that momentum to drive change uh, meaningfully for the organization, but also for markets and, and society. So we there is a white paper about entrepreneurship um, in a broader sense, uh, and uh, you're very welcome to to download this in the attachments. Um, and obviously, feel free to get in touch with us and specifically with Celine for any further questions about Next. And actually, Celine, I believe um, you're, you're looking at how to share more of these types of uh, activities across other organizations, right? So, so you're open to other people uh, from other organizations getting in touch to see how they can join the Next movement in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, really, we're, we're open to any kind of external connection. So if you're working for another organization, small or big, it doesn't matter. And you have an interest in the topic. If you want to learn more about how we've done things at, at Next, I'm happy 
um, to share. And uh, if you are thinking of building something similar or you already have something similar and want to touch base, again, we're, we're really looking forward in 2021 to uh, connect with more people outside of Zurich and, uh, and yeah, kind of help each other. We, we really see this as a very collaborative space. Uh, we already have some contacts, but we would love to build that out more. So please don't be shy. Send me a note. Brilliant. All right. I think we're going to call it there. Thank you very much for everyone for joining and tuning in and asking your questions. And um, we'll catch you guys soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Elaine. Bye-bye.